It's poppin'. It's your boy Oliver Tree, and you're listening to WGMU Radio, your voice amplified. Awesome. Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm with singer, songwriter, producer, scooter, stuntman, DJ, online presence, and overall renaissance man, Oliver Tree. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for making time. I know you just got off your international leg of your tour and you're about to embark on your North American leg of your tour. So super busy time. And again, just thanks for being here. Um, I do have quite a few questions. So let's get started with that. Um, number one, we're diving right into it. Um, you've said that music is your religion and that making music saved you, um, but then also at some point that no one was listening to what you're making. So what would your life have looked like if there was no Oliver Tree? And also following up with that, if you ever stopped making music, what do you think your life will look like then? Uh, I think music has saved me from addiction. It became my main addiction. So I think without music filling the, the void in my soul, um, I probably would have been full-fledged drug addict still. I was in an earlier part of my life, so it saved me from that, um, gave me purpose, gave me destiny. I think if I wasn't making music, I would be just focused fully on directing. Um, I've written four feature film screenplays, and I probably would be just focused on those, but music is kind of consumed me at this point so i'm kind of putting that on ice and then i've kind of made my live show into a movie so it's allowed me to satisfy my needs as a filmmaker as well as directing and producing and writing my music videos so it's kind of my film school and uh allowed me to justify not um being full-fledged filmmaker um i know that you first of all i know that you wrote, wrote like 30 pages for of a screenplay for this so that's really impressive that's really cool um and then also i know that you went to business school for like two years um so what was your thought process with that and would you ever go anywhere within business because i'm a i'm a business marketing major so it's kind of funny like there's a kinship there yeah so business is pretty much every degree you know like i mean not degree sorry let me retry that yeah uh business is pretty much everything in life as far as any kind of job is business related. Um, even if you sell sandwiches, it's a business, you know? So the business of art is really no different. Um, it's been something I've been more focused on marketing, probably more so than art in the last five years, because that is the only way people hear the art. So art is comes first always and always will. And it is the centerpiece, but you would probably, be lying to yourself if you didn't say 90% of being an artist nowadays isn't tied to the marketing aspect. Now, the thing that I can justify doing that is because I can turn my art, um, my marketing can be turned into art. So I use every marketing piece as an art form. Um, just it's the only way I can justify spending that much time marketing. Yeah, that's that's super cool. Um, and again, your presence kind of like permeates internet culture and everyone knows you even if they don't know that they know you. Um, I asked my six year old dad, I asked my 34 year old millennial super removed from like internet culture cousin and they were like, I have no idea who that is. And then I showed them a picture, I showed them um, your songs and they're like, okay, I know exactly who that is. So it's really impressive that you've been able to make um, yourself such a permanent part of internet culture for so long, um, even since like 2017, 2018 with your Vine stuff, right? Um, so that's that's super cool. Um, and again, music has been so important to you. So what would you say that, what would you say is a song or body of music um, that you would say has helped you the way that other people say your music has helped them? Because I know you were talking about people say that you're like, your music has saved their life and stuff like that. So I was wondering if there's something like that for you. For me, it would probably be the first Gorillaz album. Um, I believe it's just a self-titled album. That kind of showed me that you could mix together as much different forms of genres of music. Um, I think it kind of created a blueprint for how to merge styles. And before that I was making five different styles of music. One day I would make classical music. One day I would make rock music. One day I'd make a rap song. One day I'd make a house song. And I was just like, what am I doing here? What? None of this stuff connects. Uh, am I just wasting my time? Is this five separate projects? And then I realized with that gorillas first album that you can pretty much marry it all together so that kind of became the blueprint of what i was to work off of for the next few years to come um would you say that or like what's your favorite gorilla song that just like means the most to you or that you listen to the most or whatever um 
I would say uh, right now it's Dare um, because I've been working really focused on my next iteration of the Oliver Tree project, which is my DJ project, Dr. Oliver Tree. And I spent the last year and a half working on that. And um, I used to be a DJ in high school. I opened up for Skrillex when I was 17. That was the last show I played. And then two weeks ago, I played the the first show and DJ set in 13 years. And that was at Antarctica. So I kind of debuted my oh, that was Antarctica. Yeah, I played three sets out there, two dance, one oh. ambient. And um, and now I'm just working right now, like before we did this call, I'm just working on editing the full visual show mm -hmm. for it. So it's it's something I've spent a year and a half. It's the most, it's the hardest work I've ever put in on. Um, I mean, it's taking me the longest really to make this set. So that, I say dare because I put dare into that set. And I've chopped it up and yeah. kind of made my own version out of it. I can't wait to hear that. Um, I have a question relating to your DJing, actually. Um, so you got your, as you said, you got your start kind of with dubstep DJing, and you kind of got known because of that. Well, I actually played in like rock bands before that. Oh, yeah, in rock middle school, and high school, right? Yeah. So yeah. there was many different iterations before yeah. that, but um, as a DJ was when I got my first agency, okay, okay, okay. and then that ended up basically they. They told me that they were looking to focus more on producers, which I had produced a bit at the time, but I wasn't really making tons of music. So I focused over to make music and none of it was electronic music and especially yeah. dubstep. And I couldn't force myself to make freaking dubstep for God's sake. So I kind of ended up making bedroom pop music and then that ended up getting me an independent record deal and that record deal fell apart and I had to take a hiatus for multiple years while I made maybe five or six albums that never came out and realized I couldn't stop making music no matter if anyone heard it or it was just me, I still had to make it. So it ended up being something where I kind of realized I had to do music. It was just something I was always going to do and I might as well figure out a way to try to survive off of it. Yeah. Um, again, I, I was listening to you in like 2017, 2018. Um, I think I was in like middle school at the time, which is crazy. Wow. Um, yeah. So like cheapskate, all I got, um, my favorites. Um, so that's, that's super cool. But um, so relating to DJing, so I know that you kind of left because of like the environment and also because you wanted to make music um, or like you had to make music. But um, kind of having had that space from DJing um, and having your own very like rich like musical history and um, successful music career um, and kind of returning to DJing now, how would you say your relationship has changed to just DJing itself and that environment and that type of music? I think it's amazing because since I've been so focused on putting together audio visual shows and experiences like the concert that uh i'll be playing in washington um that's a fully immersive mixture of this movie tv show broadway play uh obviously a concert wwe wrestling stand-up comedy motivational speaking obviously some karate belly dancing and scooter stunts obviously. yeah that's like super super dense mainly centered around performance art performance and audio visual experience so i've put together i've been writing the list i think this is my seventh or eighth audio visual show and so returning back to making this new sidestep in my career as a dj i feel so liberated as an artist because i'm able to have more of a performance artist approach to the djing and also a producer approach so like since i've been working on that for a year and a half it's like so heavily produced out that i'm able to do i think a very forward thinking attempt at djing and approach to it where it's taking the idea of djing and expanding so far beyond it and making it such a fingerprints all over it uh it's fully like immersive all taking all my favorite cinema and chopping it up to oblivion and taking all my favorite nostalgic music i grew up listening to and chopping it up to oblivion and making this very nostalgic blend of everything i've known and loved and has really inspired me as oliver tree as an artist and merging it together into one super set of experience that kind of touches on all the senses and very visceral like i was editing it last night and chopping it up and i actually started crying seeing some of it because it was so and it was very it's very visceral and gnarly and raw and i'm i think i'm going to challenge what the idea of a dj is and can be especially as a performance artist and like when i played in antarctica i came out in a full surgeon outfit and um because it's this whole doctor theme and 
you know, even just playing on the boat, I played with Diplo and Flume and all these awesome DJs, but everyone just wears t-shirts. And for me, as a performance artist, I want to contribute some very kind of outside the box approaches to what DJing can be. So I'm really excited about pushing forward as a, taking the idea of, you know, art and performance art and applying that to DJing and working with the boundaries and doing something totally different in the dance space. So I'm very excited. That's that's really, really cool. Um, and even seeing clips of your, your show and everything, it's super crazy, just like all the things that you've managed to make your show. Um, just like kind of out of curiosity, would you ever do like a boiler room set or anything like that? I think not right now because the show that I'm curating on this DJ set is so like, it's something I want to yeah. recycle and reuse a lot. Same with like my Oliver Tree live show um, where I prefer not to have them recorded so that I can, the only place people can see it is if they come see it at the show and they get the live immersive experience. I think maybe at, before I retire the set or something, there's a world where I could play it there but ultimately i think it's a disservice to because for me it's it's about making these shows that are every millisecond is planned out every tiniest micro hair detail to the to the tiniest 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 blimp is all manufactured and planned out so that i can take people on a really calculated journey and um and i think it's it's probably something that i prefer to just have people come see if they care to do so uh, but maybe before i retire stuff i can i can do one last hurrah somewhere like that yeah okay totally um so again going from that craziness of this massive production that you're living every night um in, in cities across the world and across the country um you said that the crash from touring to living in like normalcy or living a normal life can be pretty depressing um so is there like an everyday mundane activity that you look forward to or miss when you're um on tour just like doing the laundry or like washing the dishes just something about like normal on the low life that you miss yeah. when you're away well thank god i i don't do laundry or dishes or anything because i don't live anywhere so yeah, yeah. i don't have there is no the only normalcy i have in my life is there is no normal um okay. i don't live anywhere i just live in hotels um I've been doing that. There was only one year during COVID where I lived somewhere. Uh, but yeah, what I think you're referring to is that after a big tour, sometimes you can feel post-tour depression yeah. because you're going from maybe 5,000 people screaming your name every night to then, you know, returning back to, because if I get sick or something, sometimes I'll go to my parents' house to recover um, or wherever I go. And sometimes I, I had an experience after my first tour after COVID and I kind of felt some pretty felt a bit depressed after coming down from that to go from the such extremes to just having a calming waking moment. But um, as it sat and as I've kind of, that was after just such a long time of not touring, I think that played a factor in now that I'm back at it. I haven't experienced that at all. Maybe I will after this tour, but um, yeah, I've just kept going nonstop. Like I went to, yeah, all seven continents in two and a half months and I kept traveling, so the last three months has literally just been nonstop chaos. What's your jet lag? I don't get it. I've been really? working out now, getting into a healthy place. Okay. I'm sober, so I don't do any drugs or anything, and mm -hmm. uh, try to take some melatonin to sleep on the plane. Um, and yeah, I haven't had any jet lag at all. I haven't had jet lag for a while now, so I've figured out kind of a strategy of taking sleeping medicine, uh, melatonin, just kind of like try to get on the same sleep schedule and sleep on the airplane no matter what time it is and then waking up whatever time I can and you know like for example I flew in last night from Hong Kong and then wake up at seven and hit the gym and then get into work so it's been a pretty good system like I flew like uh, what was it from Antarctica from Chile I flew yeah. like 32 hours and then flew in took a uber to my parents house ran six miles and then got in the car and drove yeah. five my grandma's house and it's like a way that i can set my clock and kind of get in but I've, I've figured out kind of a strategy with it so that i don't have to deal with jet lag i haven't caught okay. it in a long time yeah you're on the grind that's awesome going on to music videos i know that you've said like music videos are kind of again your filmmaking it's very important to you um and that's a large part of your creative identity so is there a memorable music video that um has kind of like informed your filmmaking or something that you were looking at growing up being like i want to do something like this so of someone else's work yeah yeah well i think my favorite music video 
is um, Apex Twins Window Liquor. And in the beginning of it, there's this uh, limousine stretch shot where it keeps going. And I've um, built off of that idea and explored that in a couple different videos of mine. Um, but that video is my favorite music video of all time. And I would say uh, it's probably one that has inspired me the most uh it's by chris cunningham and um really psychedelic bizarre music video if you've never seen it check it out it's, yeah. it's called apex twins window liquor um your music videos are very absurd and i remember watching them in middle school they kind of i was kind of a um a scaredy cat so they kind of freaked me out i can't lie um I so that you had that effect on me um but i loved your music so i mean everything's good how was it performing in antarctica and how do you even like organize that what like where did that even come from um it was amazing for one i think antarctica is by far the coolest place i've ever traveled to and i've been to a lot of amazing places but that one took the cake it's the pretty much the last preserved untainted space um just being surrounded by the most massive glaciers and hearing and seeing them fall and being surrounded by thousands of penguins in their natural state and orca whales humpback whales watching their their tails submerge into the water and um yeah it was just magical i filmed a feature length documentary out there so i'm really excited i think it's the craziest thing i've ever filmed in my entire life and uh the shows were amazing and um yeah i wasn't i've been trying to do it for years i've been trying to take my band out there um but people were quoting a million dollars to freight all the gear out there and realistically it's very complicated to play on the actual ice so when when i played it was inside um this boat so i feel like i still haven't yet properly got to do the full thing i'm hoping to bring my band back and do a show on the ice but there's a lot of restrictions and it's very like the land's very protected and they don't want you to make any kind of imprint there so you have to yeah take that into account it's very complicated to do but yeah i had some friends that were playing and i kind of tricked my way into it and um always you know scheming up a way to do something and make it possible and to be an artist is to be a con artist you know and you have to figure out ways to trick people into giving you funding to make stuff and trick your way into different scenarios and when i say trick i mean i also worked my ass off and made it possible but realistically there's a luck factor and there's a scheming factor that is tied into being able to manifest things that's super cool um so is there any idea on, like when that'll be out your documentary or just i don't know i've filmed like 30 of them so far and most of them haven't come out we put out one that was uh how to make a million dollar music video that was filmed in ukraine a while back and then i filmed like maybe there's a couple other ones that are out but um this one I'm hoping will be one of the will be the first one I release, but I haven't even begun the editing process. So it could be three, four months. It could come out in five years. I don't know. A lot of these videos, some of them are already some of these documentaries are five years old. And the idea is treating it as a document and making it a documentary instead of treating it as content and having it just kind of fly out. But that being said, yeah, I'm I'm hoping it'll be something that can be pursued in the next few months. That's super awesome. I'm looking forward to the premiere of that. Um, I think our time is running out. So do you have any parting words for people my age? I'm like, obviously college age, 19. Um, so anything that you want today's generation to know um, about you or about life or any advice and just anything else that you want to say? Yeah, I think the main key is um, find what you love, find what you would do for free, what you would do just by yourself to enjoy that you really fucking love and just get good at that do it at the highest level possible and um and if you really want to do something especially as a career path there is a way to monetize on it there is a way to make money on it but you'll need to be willing to spend at least 10 years of your life broke sleeping on couches i even slept on a couch for an entire month this year not because i necessarily had to but because i was so focused on creation and doing my thing you have to be prepared to scrape by and do whatever you can and just the main key component is failure and you have to be prepared to fall on your face get your hands dirty and just literally fail because i would say my entire existence as an artist has been one monumental failure after another um there's only been a few fleeting moments of success and i use the term 
differently than maybe other people would. For me, um, success is only used as a term for something that's changed your life level success. Um, besides that, everything else is essentially a failure and that makes the word failure not have negative connotation because even if an art piece came out, then it was a success for me. But ultimately, unless it was, you know, sold a million copies worth of equivalent and went platinum, it's a failure in my eyes. And um, failure is good. Failure is how we get to the next level. I don't think uh, we evolve if we think we've really figured anything out. If we feel like we've really succeeded, then what's the point of continuing? So failure is key and um, be prepared to fail more than you could ever imagine and, and enjoy that and learn and, and evolve from that each time. That's great. I think a lot of people need to hear that and me as well. It's very insightful. Um, so again, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, everyone can catch you, I think, the 24th of January at the Anthem in Washington, D.C. Um, and stream Oliver Tree anywhere you can get music and Oliver Tree, all your social media and everything. Um, so I know I'm looking forward to your show and seeing everything that you put out. Um, thank you so much for being here. I hope you rest so much. I hope you have a great day and a great start to your tour. Thank you so much. Appreciate it all. I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.